Okay, well, welcome Sarah and Trevor. As you see at the bottom of the page there, we've now got our participants entering for today's webinar. Uh, as we do each fortnight, we'll just uh, hold fire for a uh, short period of time just while everyone comes into the, to the um, platform. Um, as we were talking earlier, Trevor, fantastic photo there. Yes. Uh, while we're while we're killing some time, where where, where is that? Uh, that's uh, at uh, Patmos. That you'll hear more about uh, later. And there's Samos and Ikaria in the background. Very not the little ones, the big ones. And uh, the place that that camera is located is the. Um, the monastery at the top of the hill, which was built in the 11th century. And uh, I'm assuming that's a, a sunset? That's a good, no, uh, yeah, uh, oh. yes, it's a sunset. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking south. Uh, looking north. Ah, okay. Of course, yeah. sunset, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. very good. And so you, that you go that way if you're headed across the uh, Aegean. And just while we're waiting for everyone to come in, so that that uh, that that's probably in what a, an August or or is that a May or a June? That picture is, uh, I think, a September actually. Yes. It's either September or June because we never go there in July yes. and August anyway. Yeah. Um, but uh, I would say. I'm not sure, what, do you remember which year it's from, Maggie? No, not off the top of my head. But anyway, what we'll do now is we'll keep rolling. We've got quite yep. a few, few uh, uh, participants have joined into the webinar. So yep. as we do each week, my name is Greg Boller. I'm, I'm uh, here hosting this week's multi hold Solutions webinar. Uh, over the last number of weeks, we've gone from uh, doing walkthroughs on Fontaine de Jou, uh, yachts, and Neil Trimorans, uh, Iliad power catamarans, uh, Fontaine de Jou power catamarans, and we've also been talking to people about tips on cruising. And, and uh, two weeks ago, we had a fantastic webinar on uh, uh, first aid for cruisers. But this week, we're turning the, uh, the page and we're heading to the Mediterranean, which I know for a lot of people, uh, with all of the recent travel restrictions and so on, we're probably pining to get back to the Med for a lot of people or go there for our first visit. So we thought it would be great uh, to uh, get our friends uh, Trevor and Sarah and Maggie from Mariner Boating to uh, help us today to uh, present everything they know after many, many years of uh, taking groups through the uh, Turkish coast and the, the Greek islands uh, with their brand Mariner Boating Holidays. And so for some people who are tuning in for this, they may be people who have uh, recently purchased or already have their own yachts in the med. And for others who are tuning in, it might be people who are considering the uh, future opportunity of going with Mariner Boatings on a, on a trip. But it's also just a great way to get a, a, a walkthrough or a, um, a taste of what's available in that region. So to do that today, we're going to let the Mariner Boating Team walk us through one of their itineraries. We thought that was the best way of just giving people a glimpse of this region. And uh, Trevor and uh, his team have put together a fantastic presentation. Uh, and just while we're waiting, we've still got some people coming in. I'll just click to the next slide uh, when I work out how. I do have the technology. So we've still got more of these webinars planned. They, we've been doing them since we started uh, in lockdown way back there in uh, what end of March, early April. And the success of the webinars has meant that uh, we'd like to keep them rolling. And for those who've missed any of the webinars, you can go back or you can go on to the uh, multi Hole Solutions YouTube channel. And we have all of our uh, previous webinars there. And it's been impressive to see the number of views that they uh, each of them are, are getting. Uh, I think our most popular to date was actually the walkthrough on the Elba 45, which is the new Fontaine de Jou model that was launched. Uh, so coming up in two weeks time, we've got a similar uh, theme to this uh, week in terms of talking about a destination. We're going to another destination. We're gonna talk about sailing in Indonesia. 
and we're going to do that with our partner South, uh, Sail South Pacific. So looking forward to that one. And then uh, two weeks after that, just three days ago, the, uh, an Iliad 50 was delivered off the ship into Brisbane. Uh, that boat's been currently put together. I think Rachel, who's in the background with us today, said that this morning she's been down on board that boat. We're going to do a, a live walkthrough of that Iliad 50 in, uh, on the 9th of October. And then a couple of weeks after that, we're going to look at cruising resources. And this is uh, an opportunity to have a look at all those support uh, mechanisms or, or apps or um, electronics and so on that are there to help you... Uh, uh, be help you when you're cruising. Uh, that's in partnership with Nebo, who have a fantastic uh, uh, tracking and uh, information sharing app and Zulu Waterways Cruising Guide. So that'll be on the 23rd of October. And then uh, two weeks after that, we're going to another destination. We're going to go and uh, have a look at the Southwest Pacific with our friends from Down Under uh, Cruising Rally, who uh, were actually involved with us in our very first webinar. And so it'll be great to welcome them back in November. So that's what's coming up in the next few weeks. And then if uh, the screen does what I tell it to, uh, what we're going to do now is I'm just going to hand over to Sarah, uh, who's just going to have a quick chat before handing over to Trevor. Is that correct, Sarah? It is. Thanks, Greg. It's really nice to be here, of course, and with no offence. I'd rather actually be in Europe, but you know, receiving this invite is a second best opportunity. Um, we've had a really nice time going through our photos and reminiscing about one of our favorite events and in our favorite part of the Mediterranean and of course with some of our longest standing friendships. So it's been, yeah, a good reminisce for us and a good opportunity to remember stories and have a laugh while practicing a webinar and interrupting Trevor with our very hilarious stories. Maggie and I thought it was great. Trevor probably didn't agree, but we had a good time. <laughs> so for those people that don't know Mariner Boating Holidays, we're a small business. Um, it's mum, dad and me. And then we have amazing support from my sister and we also have two part-time staffers. So yeah, a small family business with long-standing staff who, um, you know, uh, we're having a pretty chaotic year at the moment, as we all are, but we're, um, yeah, hanging in there and doing the best we can. So um, we hope you enjoy our reflections on this itinerary. We look forward to working with multi-health multi -health solutions moving forward. And I'm going to hand over to Trevor, who dragged me around the Mediterranean from the time that I was about four. And yeah, it's our very, very favourite, most treasured itinerary. So, Dad, away you go. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Sarah. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Rachel. And hello, everybody. And uh, I get a bit passionate about this subject and could talk all day and all night. So I've scripted a consensus of our thoughts. If it looks like I'm reading, it's because I am. So you're looking there at a map of the Aegean as, sorry, you're looking at a picture of Maggie and me and uh, Sarah on my right. Uh, we've been creating, planning and organizing and hosting events in the Med for a long time, since 1985, in fact. We lived in Greece from 1975 and first sailed in Turkey in 1977. Many places have changed over time, but being different doesn't necessarily have to be negative. Sarah has decided it's time for us to rest a little. We've amassed a raft of knowledge between us and had a great time introducing folks to the places and people we love. This is the map of the Aegean between Turkey and uh, Greece, mainly two groups of islands, the Kikladis on the left and uh, the Dodecanese on the right. The Mediterranean summer is hot and dry with rainfall rare between May and September. Summer maximum temperatures are in the mid thirties while the best sailing is probably between May, June, 
September and even October in Turkey. The prevailing wind in the summer is the Meltemi, which blows from the north at the interface of two major weather systems, one over Pakistan and the other one over the middle Atlantic. Many days, however, will be calm in the morning, then with a gentle thermally powered breeze in the afternoon for a bit of sailing on flat water. The Greek islands of the Eastern Aegean, where we've moved now, uh, are comprised mainly of the 12 islands in the Dodecanese group between Samos and Rhodes. Dodecanese, by the way, means 12, Deca is 10, and Do is 2, 12. Starting in the north, the island chain follows the coast of Turkey in a southeasterly direction. 36 degrees north latitude is the southern extent of the group down there by Rhodes. The islands and the Turkish coasts are high and the wind turns westerly as you follow the coast south. The straight line distance, this is a bit of a joke really, the straight line distance from Samos in the north to Rhodes in the south is 100 nautical miles, which we take two weeks to do by the way. Now meet uh, Mike and Marita ambassadors for multi-hole solutions and owners of uh, Elba 45, and they've been based in the Med for several years. In 2021, with them, we'll be following the route shown on the preceding chart in a rally of Fontaine Peugeot lovers. We're welcoming yachts both chartered and privately owned. This is a route uh, we have followed for the last 35 years, and we have many friends along the way. Hi, Mike and Marita, if you're listening. I think they are, Trevor. Good. <laughs> From Turkey. To... Sorry? They're in Turkey and they're tuned in. Yes. Right. I'm sorry it's so early in the morning, about six o'clock, I think. We're like, we like to start uh, a cruise in this area in Kushadasi, Turkey, which is also an exit port if you're heading to Greece. If you've not been to Kushadasi before, it's well worth a visit. The shopping is excellent, the people are simply terrific, and the town and the adjacent area are steeped in history. The town of Kushadasi is built around tourism and is very busy in high summer, but this is not the case in May, June. The Kismet Hotel, which we use for pre-rally accommodation, is owned by the granddaughter of the last Sultan of Turkey. The photos of well-known people around the lobby are just amazing. Also in Kusudasi is this extraordinary place called the Caravan Sarai, it was built in the 16th century and was a stopping place for camel caravans on the Silk Route. The camels stayed in the quadrangle and the goods for sale were displayed in the shops around the ground floor. The merchants and the camel drivers stayed upstairs which today have been converted into the five-star Club Caravan Sarai Hotel. The walls are amazing, 75 centimetres thick at least, and it's a real experience just to wander around the hotel. Stop for a coffee or a cold drink. Or drop into a carpet shop. This is something that's a must do in Turkey. Carpets are a big attraction there and for very good reason, although the Persians and the Afghanis will tell you their carpets are better. I won't enter that debate, but we don't have any room left for Turkish carpets in our house. The key to buying a carpet is to check the official certification before you buy it if it's claimed to be handmade. If you're a buyer, the merchant will happily ship the acquisition home for you, so you don't have to take it with you in your baggage. Even if you're not a buyer, you should hear the story while enjoying a cup of Turkish tea with the merchant. Accepting the invitation to a cup of tea will not obligate you in any way to purchase, but if you love it, you better do it. 
May, May is, of course, the month of puppies in Turkey, and they don't burn off until early June. Maggie can't resist photographing them, and this is only one of hundreds. Late spring is a wonderful time to enjoy the colour and smell of Turkey. May is also a great month to visit the ancient city of Ephesus. Just a short ride from Kuchadasi, this amazing site is best approached from the top gate. Easier to walk down the hill, of course. It's not so hot and busy in high, as it is in high summer when there can be up to five cruise ships per berth in Kuchadasi and they all come for one reason, to go to Ephesus. As you walk down the hill, you will see some icons that you recognize. Here is uh, Nike, who was the goddess, the goddess of uh, victory. Sorry, I just said what I was supposed to say <laughs> later on. I'm looking at two screens here. <laughs> you all, yeah, I've already said that. Bit. Okay, moving along. Sorry, folks. Going very well, Trev. We'd suggest seeing the terrace houses which are still being excavated but it is an extra charge at the entrance you need to make your decision before you go in it's not expensive but you can't buy a ticket once you're there a guide is a must do to get the facts i was amazed to learn for example that the marble tiles on the floors and walls of the villas are cut with silk thread water and lots of elbow grease you can only imagine how long a delivery of a thousand square meters of tiles would have taken. The reconstructed library is also famous and connected by tunnel to the brothel across the road. Nothing changes really. <laughs> if your boat is already in Turkey and you want to sail in Greece, you must formally exit and then enter Greece in Samos. If you're on your own yacht, you will need an agent because the authorities these days will not complete exit entry formalities without one. That might have changed, Mike, but uh, that's what we understand to be the case. We will depart Turkey from Kusadasi Marina, but if your boat is already in Greece, you might consider crossing to Kusadasi on the ferry just to see the sights. The photo was taken from the Kismet Hotel Terrace. There have been political tensions between Greece and Turkey for centuries, and each has occupied the other at various times in history. At ground level, though, you will see very quickly that they work happily together. Their customs, cuisine, and many of the people are almost exactly similar as my Turkish friend Metin would tell you. And I hope Metin is watching because I rang him and told him he should. <laughs> it's six o'clock for him as well. The entry port in Greece is Pythagorion on the island of Samos where Pythagoras was born. The key is pretty small and berthing is usually difficult, but there's a protected anchorage immediately outside the harbor entrance and a full service marine, marina just next door. This may be your first experience with Mediterranean mooring, bow anchor with a stern tied to the key. The depth is in the order of four to five meters, but because the key is semicircular, it can be tricky to avoid having another boat lay his chain over yours. Use at least 30 meters of your own chain. All Mediterranean charter yachts have an all chain anchor system and a remote handheld control. The anchor is power up, and power down, albeit with an optional free drop if you want to use the winch handle. Pythagorion is the oldest man-made port in recorded Mediterranean history. Walk the harbour wall to see the various contributions to its construction. Samos is mountainous, verdant and famous for its fruit and wine. The island is 40 kilometers long, so a drive in the countryside is well worth hiring a car or minibus for. Some of the roads are winding and narrow and have not been surfaced since they were first laid in the days of Pythagoras, and I'm not sure when he was born. The picture on the left there is a little bit difficult. Look at it carefully. It's the famous 
F. Polinos Aqueduct Tunnel, which is over a kilometre long and was dug through the mountain behind Pythagorion to provide access to their water supply. It was dug simultaneously from both sides with extraordinary engineering accuracy, given that it was built 2,500 years ago. Samos was also famous for boat building and the local pine called Oxia was extremely true grained and very durable. The village of Manolatis, which is at the right of that picture, is well worth a visit high up and looking across the sea to Turkey. Leave your car in the car park because there are no vehicular roads in the village. Pythagorion has many good restaurants and shops and this square is at the front of the building where Pythagoras was born. The semicircular waterfront is where Mark Antony and Cleopatra inebriated their troops in a three month party before the fateful battle with Octavian at Actium in Western Greece. They boarded 500 ships in this port to take that trip. If you prefer lunch by the sea, you will enjoy the best octopus in the world, ten rides, of course, in a cement mixer. So Trevor, just like in, in this location, like Samos, where you are there, if you were wandering along and wanted to sit down and have lunch at one of these restaurants, how much would that cost me? Oh, 30 euros, max. That's yeah. like 40 bucks with wine. With yeah. wine, yeah. 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 And, the, and, and you don't need labelled wine. The stuff that the guy produces himself is very often the best anyway. If it's no good, well, you haven't lost much. But yeah. it's, it's not expensive. And just going back to in Samos in the in the harbour there as an example, yeah. where you were saying where that you you're anchoring stern two. I'm yeah. not sure if you said like if I wanted to go in there in a catamaran and, and more stern two, how much are, are they going to charge us? Well, that's not that's a public uh, key, so that's not going to be a lot of money either. It might cost uh, thirty euros, which like fifty dollars. Yes. Um, and it, and it, that's like, and all through that area, is that first in, first served? Can you yes. phone ahead and book or? Well, look, with the rally, it's a, it's a question of not what you know, but who you know. And it's amazing what you can do when you can ring the right person. Yes. But if I'm saying there with uh, Pythagorean, which could be difficult even for one boat, yes. there is a perfectly safe uh, anchorage just outside the harbour. And there's a full service marina just around the point. So, you know, if you want to be really secure, you go to the marina. If you want to be near the town, you go to the anchorage by the entrance. At, yes. If you can't get it alongside or stern to the quay, you can go bow for us as well if you want. Yes. But Mediterranean mooring just seems to be stern too. Fantastic. The other thing with getting a spot in these little places is that quite often they have the day boats visiting during the day for short trips and they actually yes. won't give the places away until later in the afternoon. So it's a teetering thing where you don't want to get there too early and you can't get there too late and yes. they won't give you anything until the day boats have gone. Interesting. And that would be the case all through the Greek islands and Turkish islands. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and Greg, as an extension of that, if you do get there early and there isn't any room, you just go and anchor and keep an eye on the key. Yes. And as soon as a spot becomes available, it's the charge of the light brigade. Yes. And then if you do anchor off and you go in and you dinghy, there's obviously then a little key where you can then tie up your dinghies, yeah? Absolutely. Yes. No yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah. Very good. We recommend uh, the Cosmos restaurant in Samos, which is in a place called Avlaki, where our friends Branka and her partner Tassos will do you proud. We've known them for how long, Sarah? 30 years? 40? Oh, since I was four. Four. <laughs> <laughs> That's the maitre de taverna preparing your fish for lunch. Contrary to what you might think, there are still fish in the Aegean, although taking your fishing gear with you won't necessarily guarantee your success. The food prepared in Cosmos by Tasso is based on Greek cuisine, but with an emphasis on quality, organic, sorry, organic, locally grown produce. You might care for a swim 
after lunch, but I'm afraid the pebble beach may test your soles. I'm talking about the ones on your feet. But the water is absolutely pristine, crystal clear. On the way to um, Ablaki or up to Manalatis, uh, Kokari is a great little spot to stop for uh, an iced coffee called a frappe in Greece. I don't know what an iced coffee is called here other than iced coffee. Anyway, stop in Kokari and look at the scenery. It is fantastic. Then uh, we take our first passage in company with the other rally boats. If you'll see from the chart, follow the line, the 20 miles to our destination should be across a 15 to 20 knot northerly breeze coming between Samos and Ikara, Ikaria. That will give you a, a, an apparent wind direction of about 67 degrees, which for one of these uh, Fontaine Peugeot's should give you what, Greg, 14 knots of breeze? No, 14 knots of boat speed? The charter boats will not have spinnakers, but some of the private ones will. If your boat has a spinnaker, this is the perfect place to use it. Sorry about that, Trevor, I had my mute on, but yes, in answer to your question, yeah, 14 would be a lot, but uh, no, that I'm not eight to 12 anyway. knots range, but, but yeah. conditions, it must be just beautiful sailing. The charter boats, uh, Aki has more goats than people, less than one kilometre of made road, one motor vehicle, and four kids at the local school. The Port of Augusta, that's not it, it's just around the corner to the right, is tiny, but there is an exquisite anchorage, this one, next door, where it is safe and easy to access the port by dinghy. Our mate on Arki is Manoli, and he and I are blood brothers, and I won't tell you that story, but we've been eating at his taverna called Tripas for at least 30 years. He probably do slow roasted goat in tomato sauce for our dinner and then play some of his music from around of the world. And I believe Sharon Stone sat there one night and listened to it. This is a nice little story. It's true. I checked it in the history. Pirates once captured Julius Caesar, who was on his way from Rome to Rhodes and held him for ransom on Archie. And he famously requested that the ransom be increased to reflect his status in Rome. The increase was from 20 to 50 talents, equal to 2,500 kilograms of gold or 160 million US dollars these days. Arki is only a few miles off the coast of Turkey during the refugee crisis, the locals would give dry clothes to the arriving survivors of the overnight passage, feed them and take them to Patmos for the ferry ride to Athens. This is people who had nothing of their own really. This crisis was overcome when the Turks built facilities near the Syrian border where today they accommodate nearly 3.6 million people displaced by wars in the Middle East. The goats on Arki produce the best feta cheese in Greece, such that the local feta is not available in Arki, but it's a bit like our gas, I suppose. But what is available is pretty good. The goat bells ringing across the harbour will make splendid music in the morning as they leave the milk shed, milking shed and head for pasture. The honey is also to die for, put some on the local yoghurt for breakfast. After a swim stop, we'll take the short passage across to Patmos, 10 miles. Breakfast with Manali, though, is an experience all by itself, so you won't want to be in a hurry to leave. And I think I asked you this the other day, Trevor. Um, generally, on these rallies that you do, the, the, uh, the, the Mariner boating rallies, people are a bit concerned that it means that they're going to have to get up really early every day. And, what, what's what sort of what, what's your get up get up and go time? 
Oh, 11. Oh, you don't... <laughs> Yeah. Well, get, get up and go time is different from everybody else's get up and go time, but we actually can constrain him in the cabin until yes. a reasonable hour of nine o'clock. Yes, oh, okay. that's the earliest, I would say. Uh, look, <laughs> it's a function of the breeze, Greg. The, yes. If there's no Meltemi on, the breeze is thermal, and it's a yes. bit like our northeaster of yes. the east coast of Australia. There, nothing happens until noon. And yes. it's also a function of how far you've got to go and what the birthing uh, arrangements are where you're headed. And yes. of course, we try to make all of our arrangements for birthing in advance. So it doesn't really matter what time we get there. And in terms of that, Mel Tammy, uh, being a, a, a thermal breeze in the evenings, what time does it sort of start turning off? 10 past five. Okay. So once you're in the anchorage, <laughs> once you're in the anchorage, the breeze yeah. drops. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And the we're, wind really on the way, but... find, we're really good at finding the protected spaces. So if the wind's going to keep going or come from whatever angle, we're really good at kind of tucking in behind it so that we are yes. protected. For example, if there is a Meltemi, it'll blow four, five, six, seven days at a time. Yes. It will drop in the night because it's not thermally reinforced, if you like. Yep. So you need to be somewhere safe and we take that into uh, account but when i say three four five days we're only talking 25 to 30 knots the worst part of the meltemi is that you get a short somewhat uncomfortable sea sometimes but if you're on a cat and following this route it won't matter because you have it behind you fantastic I'm just talking here about sea conditions. Uh, th this video wasn't made in uh, in the Greece. Anyway, the sea conditions through these islands along the coast of Turkey are generally comfortable. If you also get a Meltemi, it will be from behind, as I've said. And if you do need shelter, it's not very far away. And one interesting thing in Greece, the weather forecasting these days is absolutely spot on because of the Olympic Games. Yes. I need accuracy for the sailing regatta. In Patmos, uh, our Greek friend from Orange in New South Wales will fix you with a good deal on a vehicle. Get out and get around. Go for your life in the shops. There are some good ones in Patmos and many of the artifacts are locally made. A really good excursion on Patmos is Lumpy, L.A. MPI, but it's pronounced like B, Lumbi, where the fish are locally caught and the vegetables locally grown by Katerina. The family own and run the Lumpi Vitaverna, spinach salad horta, the big beans, fazolia, calamari, squid, beetroot salad, grilled fish and lobster are the specialities. The chips are deadly. The pebble beach is very clean and inviting. You'll sit on Greek restaurant chairs, of course, which will leave an impression after a long lunch, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Patmos, as I might have mentioned earlier, is the spiritual headquarters of the Greek Orthodox Church. It has thankfully been saved from mass tourism, given it has no airport and can only berth a couple of ships at a time. The icons in the 11th century monastery above the port would correct the Greek balance of payments in one swoop if they could be sold. They're not for sale. The Greek orthodoxy is an integral part of the Greek social fabric. If you introduce yourself to a priest, he will happily tell you the story, even if he doesn't speak English. Because of the wealth of the monastery, the hilltop town was laid out as a maze to make entry more difficult to people with less than honourable intent. By the way, in the days of uh, the Romans, Patmos was quite a centre for piracy in this neck of the woods. It can also be difficult to find your way home, by the way, through this maze after a night out on the town. <laughs> The way back to the 
the scene from the Cora, the Hora, the hilltop town, the port below nearly cuts the island of Patmos in two. Samos and Ikaria can be seen in the background. The way back to the port has the cave where John the Divine wrote the apocalyptic texts in the last chapter of the New Testament while he was exiled in Patmos as a result of anti-Christian persecution under the Roman Emperor Domitian. And um, Trevor, I'm just going to interrupt for a moment, if that's yeah, all right. Yeah, go for your life. One thing I, I failed to do at the start of today's webinar is just letting all those people who are tuned in and watching know that you are quite welcome to ask questions. And if you yes. want to do that, you can do that by clicking on the Q&A button and typing a question. So if you've got a question, let us know, and we'll either endeavour to answer that as we're going or we'll uh, save it for a Q&A session at the end. But I, I did fail to mention that. No, so back to where we were, and after all of this activity, there is an alternative, of course, and that is to do absolutely nothing. I could imagine you doing that, Trip. <laughs> <laughs> the next passage is down past uh, Lipsos and then on Tavathi on the southeastern corner of Kalimnos. Uh, absolutely. Lipsos is not named on this chart, but it's just below and to the left of the red to Kalinos, 28 nautical miles. By the way, most of these passengers are in this order of distance. 28 miles is actually a big day for us. We don't really often go that far. Depending on the strength and direction of the wind, we'll choose to pass Leros to port or starboard, which in turn will determine where we stop for lunch. Looks like that guy's got all the jobs. Here we go again with the kite. I think that's a Lucia 40, that one. Yes. Gee, thanks. He <laughs> won. <laughs> <laughs> Along the way, we'll stop for lunch and a swim, as I said. But uh, interestingly, in addition to the windmills on the hill, you will see as you pass Leros, there is an imposing Ottoman castle. By the way, those things you can see on the left on the top of the hill used to be windmills where they ground their grain. Today, this castle I referred to, which I don't have a decent picture of, bristles with antennae and the soldiers peering across the straits at the Turks, who are similarly engaged in reciprocal watchkeeping. Both being members of NATO, of course. In Vathi, you'll be welcomed by Sylvia, or of Puppies Taverna, and some goats with some serious mountain climbing capabilities. Sirius blue eyes suggest some cruise hater in her ancestry. The island is high and barren, but in fact, fresh water permanently, runs permanently into the sea from the springs in Vathi. In the valley leading inland, there are oases of citrus that uses the springs for irrigation. Bathy is steep sided and very narrow, so getting into getting the scope you need for a good anchor hold won't be easy. The narrow fjord like harbour can amplify the swells created by passing ships, so at night you need to be sure you have plenty of room between you and the quay. We'll have a little difficulty there getting berthed with the cats, but we'll arrange to tie you to the cliff and show you a picture of that in a minute. And Trevor, looking at that picture again, something we discussed uh, when we were rehearsing the other day, you, you, your uh, itineraries or events normally are held in uh, the start of the season or the end of the season. You always avoid the, the high summer, don't you? Correct. And, and we also... Sorry. And an anchorage like that one there, that'd be a fairly hot spot in, the, in, in the, <laughs> the middle of summer, wouldn't it? Well, you see here again, what, who you know, we would ring the guy on the key there and um, he would hold our places for us. Uh, but he would say, I want you here by four o'clock, for example. 
And then yes. as Maggie referred to the day trippers, those boats would be gone by then. So it's all a question of planning and listening, communicating with the jungle. The guy that works that harbour is called uh, Tasso. He wears a sponge on his head, happily effect, uh, accept five euros if he um, manages to tie you up. We've never had a problem. Sometimes we have to double park, no problem. People just have to step off one boat to get to the shore. Very good. And um, Greg, Everything if the temperature possible. is ever getting too hot, you just jump in the water, man. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So we've been uh, we've been lunching, dining with with uh, Sylvia for thirty odd years, um, and uh, we also have two mission, two musicians who will happily uh, play the music you'll need to learn your Zorba steps. And uh, Sylvia will continue to dance for as long as you're on your feet. I want to add a little anecdote here that Metin will relate to. We once, with those two guys, played a tune, or they did, that Metin said to me is not um, Greek. He said, this tune is Turkish. Metin happens to be Turkish. I said, Metin, do you know the words? He said, yes. I said, will you sing them for us? He said, yes. So I went to the band at their first break and said, would you mind having Metin sing the Turkish version of this song. So they played the music, he sung the song, and I can guarantee you that you could have heard a pin drop in that place, apart from the music, of course. Those sorts of things don't just happen, but they're not easy to make happen either. Anyway, on the, the following lay day, you can visit the main port, which is of, also called uh, Kalimnos, and uh, is home to the last commercial sponge fishing fleet in Greece. Visit the museum dedicated to sponge fishing. Then you can go follow the road up the western shore of Kalimnos to the world famous sport climbing cliffs. And I don't have a picture of them because it's not my cup of tea. But here we are tied to the cliff. Alternatively, you can remain tied, as I said, into the harbour, read a book and swim the turquoise sea. The beauty of this setup is that you can get the anchor, the distance away from the boat that you need to get the scope that you want. So it is truly secure and they have rings along the quay, along the cliff, so it's no big drama. Okay? Fantastic. Well, eventually it'll be time to leave uh, Kalimnos, but early in the morning of our departure day, you might catch Sylvia dockside on her motorbike. She will likely leap into the roped off pool area, fully clothed, swim a couple of laps, and then return to her taverna on her bike, dripping wet and ready for work. I kid you not. And then it's across into Turkey. It's about 20 miles. Uh, I think it's says 18 there. Once again, the wind is from the north, northwest, and uh, usually in that neck of the woods, a very nice sailing. And this is the entrance to Turkey, which is sure to be a lasting memory. The Crusader Castle stands sentinel over the harbour, built by the Knights of St. John in the 14th century. The castle variously reflects English, German and French architecture. Bodrum is a port of entry. Today, the Bodrum Castle has been restored as an underwater archeological museum, and the visit there is a must do. It's a fantastic walk from the marina around the harbor where the traditional Turkish goulets, I say park, Maggie says moor, and they're examples of those goulets along the foreshore there. They are fantastic vessels, another subject altogether. The marina we use in Bodrum is one of the best in the world, sorry, is one of the best in the Mediterranean, if not in the world. The museum has been beautifully set up and we'll arrange a guide for our tour during the rally stop. The artifacts are displayed as they would have been arranged before the demise of the vessel. 
The Turkish professor in the photograph here who helped set up the museum is married to an Australian girl. So we have all the connections necessary to make this an exceptional experience. While in Bodrum, you should visit a unique seafood market where you can choose your fish, take it to the nearby restaurant to be cooked to your taste. Surprisingly, you will also find Turkish wine to be excellent and inexpensive in spite of the fact or there have been tax increases recently aimed at discouraging local consumption. I mean, you're still only talking about, what, 10 bucks a bottle of wine, tops? 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Modernity has also come to Turkey and you will find just about everything in the musical spectrum. Make sure you visit a Turkish nightclub though. Traditional Turkish music is very rhythmic. The songs are very long and the locals seem to know all of the words to all of the songs and they will sing along with great enthusiasm until dawn, if you want to stay that long. Turkish fashion is high quality and inexpensive. On my last trip last year, collared cotton long sleeve t-shirts were $5 each and jeans 10 bucks. And I'm still wearing them, albeit they have been washed in the meantime. Interestingly, the Turkish lira is still falling against AUD and today stands at better than five to one. The AUD to Euro is also doing reasonably well standing at about 0.6 of a euro to one Aussie. Then our next passage is to, is, passes the eastern end of Kos and across the Gulf of Gokova to Nidos. The Greek and Turkish waters pilot books by Rod Heichel. If you from the area, you know the books, but there will be a copy of one of those, both of those on each of the charter boats, and they're a great source of information. The lunch stop is at Nidos, where the anchorages offer fantastic swimming and just one restaurant called Ready, Set, Go, or in Turkish, Hadi Didim Opa. Be careful of the submerged city wall on your way out, and also on your way in, of course. The anchorage is not safe in a blow due to poor holding, but the harbour we are using on our rally is only 10 miles down the track anyway. This is Palembang. It has a narrow entrance as well. So if you're a bit shy, then there is a perfectly safe anchorage just outside the entrance um, and there's good holding there. Once ashore though, it's all of a boat length across the quay to the nearest coffee shop. On our last visit there, we arranged a lamb roasted on the spit. It disappeared in a flash after we had watched and smelled it cooking for the hours before we got to it. Our host there is uh, Gurkan Chakir and he serves a main cocktail and of course we cater for birthdays on our gigs. He's also something of an entertainer, so there'll likely be some hand clapping before the night is out. Sorry, Trevor, what are those things with the elf foil on top of them there? I don't know. I'll have to tell you that, even though I'm not on camera. He <laughs> doesn't go on camera. No, no, no. Right. They, they are like a little casserole cooked in an earthenware pot. Yes. And uh, when they serve them, they literally just break the pot and let the, let the casserole fall onto your plate. And they do it so that they actually don't get too much of the grit from the earthenware pot <laughs> in the casserole. But it's like a party trick. It's ridiculous. Thank you. <laughs> it's very Turkish. <laughs> They're very good at party tricks. They have fantastic sense of humour, these guys. And yeah. as we said at the outset, we've known these fellows for many years. So it's like you know, old home week when we go chugging along there. Also a boat length across the quay is the Jardin, Jardin du Semra, 
where you'll be welcomed for Turkish coffee in the morning. Turkish coffee is the same as Greek coffee, although both countries have disputed that fact. Drinking it is an acquired taste, but once you've got it, it's fantastic. Ask for metrio, which means medium, a little sugar. I think metrio is the same in Turkey as it is in Greece, the, the word, but um, I'm not sure. Frappe is also a must. I think frappe is the same. Coffee, cold, and again, I suggest metrio and with milk. You can also have a dollop of ice cream in your metrio, which in your frappe, which is pretty good. This part of the coast has some excellent places to stop along the way uh, to Dacha, or even a place to hoist someone up the mast to take that magic photograph from the top of the mast. As I mentioned just then, Dacha pronounced ch, not k or s. Dacha is the main centre on this coast, on the Gulf of Hisaronu. Once again, it will be stern to mooring in about six metres of water. The manoeuvre can be complicated by the semicircular key, again, leading to the crossed anchor chains. We are there to help and guide you every step of the way. Bring your handheld VHF if you have one. I'm talking now to the charterers, of course. Shopping here may take some resisting. We remember a funny experience in Dutcha where one of our clients could not agree a price for a carpet. He proposed a coin toss for double or nothing on the difference to which the merchant agreed. The merchant lost the toss and honored the bet, but of course he still won. Sold the carpet. The old town of Dutcha is a few kilometres inland, located so to gain protection from the seagoing pirates. Thankfully, there are none of those around these days. The waters are very safe. I never have locked my boat and have never had anything stolen in Greece or Turkey. But that decision, of course, is up to you. Bougainvillea is a native of South America, but it sure looks great in Turkey and Greece. All along this coast, there are freshwater springs that mix with the sea, or if not, these are seagoing ducks. <laughs> Availability of fresh, clean water on all these keys is not a problem. You'll often feel the cold water springs when you're swimming there. Deersek, another 15 miles to the east, with a mountainous peninsula to the north, and the Greek island of Simi to the south has just one taverna. That's a monohull, by the way. I'm sorry about that. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> there are moorings on this key, which means your anchor hand gets a day off. It's a great lunch stop, and most everything on the menu is fresh caught. There is no road access to this bay and Dirisek in Turkish means elbow, which is the shape of the bay, which in turn means perfect protection. In Dirisek, the bargain of a lifetime may happen across your bow and we're assured that all the garments on offer are handmade from Turkish cotton, which they make in a profusion. Turkey is a very big international producer of cotton. The girl in the blue, by the way, is a fully ticketed goulet captain, anything up to 30 metres, when she's not selling clothes. And here's the lunch I was referring to. What a location. I, I asked that of you the other day. So generally, all through the region, Trevor, it's, uh, it's mostly obviously seafood, chicken. Yeah. Oh, they, they, they're big on lamb. It's mostly, uh, depends, it's mostly New Zealand or Australian, but you can even ask, and if it's Turkish, it's very good, and they do produce good lamb, you very rarely see beef anywhere. But apart from that, you're correct. And for our vegetarian uh, participants, there's a, a never-ending supply of salads. Well, look, fruits. you could ask Sarah that question. 
because I'm, she's a vegan, I'm vegan, so I take it to the next extreme. And Greece and Turkey are my ideal um, cuisine because it's just fully based on legumes and veggies, and it's amazing food. And here's another shot, by the way, of the mobile shop. And if you don't want to parley with these traders, you simply say no thanks and they'll leave you alone. Similarly though, if there is something you want that they don't have, they'll go find it for you if they can. We once had a fellow bring us a chicken following our request, but it was still alive and our kids would not consider killing it. And Sarah was one of them. <laughs> still is. Still is. <laughs> Next stop. Thanks guys. <laughs> Next stop, further into the Hisaronu. Hisaronu, by the way, means high to Widwood. It's, these mountains in the background are pretty high. And another restaurant with marina facilities. These include electricity and water. Generally, the rule is that if you stay for dinner, the berthing is free, but that proviso may vary, so you need to check. If you are on the rally, the meal ashore and the berthing and so good will be included unless you go beyond the first bottle of wine among four people. And I really have to say this, the Turks do great food and especially salad and vegetables, as Sarah said. This is a reflection of their agricultural production and it's remarkable that with a population of 85 million people, Turkey is a net food exporter. They also export water, by the way. They've got lots of it. 60% of their grid electricity is generated with hydro. A walk inland from the marina will take you uphill to the rural village of Sogut. Turkish culture, interestingly, has hospitality as a social obligation and no Turk will turn a person in need away from the door. The women seem to do most of the physical work while the men know how to win a game of checkers or what they call it, whatever they call it in Turkey. If you pick up one of these while you're snorkeling, please don't try and bring it home. It's probably a couple of thousand years old. <laughs> There's that breeze again, you see, 10 to 12 knots, flat sea. It's just forward of the beam, beautiful stuff. The leg is to this one to Bozukkale, and the entrance to the bay will test the best of navigators. It's very easy to miss it altogether. Here's what it looks like from inside. There is a, Turk, a, a Greek fortification there that's been there since BC, and uh, this, the last stop before Marmaris could well be the highlight in this whole area. The Greek fortification here was built from stone with no known source. And the blocks are at least a meter long and 50 centimeters square. It took some serious lifting therefore to get these blocks from wherever they did come from and then up onto the wall. Here's a better look at these blocks. Amazing. I tried some basic, basic arithmetic, didn't make sense, but they're seriously heavy at, at least a cubic meters, a cubic meter per rock. <laughs> <laughs> Alibaba's restaurant at the base of the fortification has its own wooden key with laid moorings. So once again, you can declare your anchor redundant for the night jump into the best swimming pool in Turkey. That's right at the back of the boats there. Dinner under the stars will not be a culinary masterpiece at Alibaba's, but the experience under the stars, I can assure you, will be very special. And here comes the mobile shop again. Next morning, you will, of course, again, take a dip to prepare for the day and your boat will be served a loaf of freshly baked village bread to, and it will be delivered. This is a classic. 
don't wait too long to visit Alibaba's because it's no certainty as to how long it's going to stand. It's looking <laughs> a bit dodgy there, if you ask me. <laughs> we do this dreadful thing called racing on our rallies, but it's not mandatory. The pass to Marmaris, uh, the passage to Marmaris doesn't have consistently good breeze because of the height of the land to windward. There will be a breeze across the valleys, but nothing in between. Here's an ideal opportunity to use that delicious bread you had delivered in the morning. And then that tri trip is northerly up the coast to Marmaris. And the place where the yachts live, the yachts that we've chartered, is Yacht Marin in Marmaris, the southern side of the port, the harbour. There is a comprehensive range of technical services available for owners who might need some assistance. Our partners in Turkey, SK Yachting, uh, um, operate the Fontaine Peugeot fleet that we've chartered, and I think there are seven or eight, or even more than that of them, so they know Fontaine Peugeot backwards. Entry formalities will not be required because we will have done them already in Patmos, but we can offer assistance to anyone who wants to go back to Greece after Marmaris. We'll have the final night celebration of the rally in the Marina restaurant in Marmaris, featuring excellent food and wine and some traditional Turkish dancing, which might even suggest some Cossack ancestry in Turkey. Cossack is what I was trying to say there. You'll observe the religious and cultural differences between Greece and Turkey along the rally route, or even if you're just cruising in that area. One conclusion I hope you'll come away with is that there are more similarities than there are differences. Mm. We have three catamarans for charter for the event, in addition to those carried over from 2020. A Sayana 47, Astria 42, and Lucia 40. All have four cabins and four heads. I'm sorry, we don't have any owner versions left. If you come on the rally and then buy a Fontaine Bajot, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg at multi Hole Solutions has a deal for you. Yes, we, we, will discuss. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will discuss. I think that what we have done with one client who's done that uh, is we discussed helping to uh, pay for their uh, their their, um, their rally. Yeah. So, yeah. Just while we're talking about that, Trevor, uh, we're getting close to the end here. Um, yes. There is a couple of questions have come through. So uh, just mention, yes. finish off with what you're about to do and then we'll just have a couple of questions. From yep. you. In um, September 21, we're planning a rally along the Lycian coast, which starts in Marmaris and goes south and east to Kekva on the way to Antalya. This could also be a cruise that you could spend months doing if you had the luxury of the time. Rachel has asked us to prepare another webinar and we'll do that, present that on March the 28th. Stay tuned. I just, there's just one other thing I wanted to say, which I think, okay. Yes, this Lycian coast um, is quite different from what we have seen of Turkey between Bodrum and uh, Marmaris. And uh, there's some just fabulous places. The water is terrific. The people are terrific. The scenery is terrific. The food's terrific. The wine is wonderful. The <laughs> temperatures are great. It never rains. It's just uh, perfect. Maggie's pointing at something here, but I don't know what she's pointing I at. I just wanted to say that it's much greener. The pine ah, trees yes, the come greener. right down to the bays on yep. the Lycian coast. And it's so pretty to just pull into those bays and smell the pines. It's beautiful. There was one other comment I wanted to make in closing, Greg, Greg, unless it's a question. At the moment, the ports of Greece are closed to boats coming from Turkey because of the coronavirus. 
um, that situation will inevitably change and uh, moving from one to the other is really just a question of completing the formalities, doing it properly and having it done by somebody else. Okay? That's it. Thank you. Okay, so I've just got a couple of questions, Trevor. First of all, that, yes, was, a, that, was, that was a tremendous uh, presentation and, and well-timed, thank you. So um, we had a couple of questions that we've already answered. Uh, first of all, Michael and Marita did say hello to us uh, by typing in from, uh, from over there in Turkey. Um, hello, Michael and Marita. <laughs> and then we had a question from Malcolm saying, can my wife and I join on these rallies if we don't have a boat yet? And the answer is, of course, that's what this is about. And I think I need to clarify that on behalf. There's two ways to participate in the Mariner Boating Rally. One is you go along and charter, or three ways. You can charter a whole boat off Mariner Boating and take your own group of friends. You can also charter a cabin on a boat and share it with other uh, people who've also booked a cabin on the boat, or if you are a current uh, Fontaine Bajot yacht owner who's already in that area and cruising and you want to just join in with this event as a way of uh, in increasing the social stimulus, let's say, you, you, can, uh, you can do that as well. So, um, so there's three ways. You can charter a boat, you can charter a cabin, or you can take your own boat, BYO boat. So I hope that answers that question for you, Malcolm. And then Frank uh, asks, how many people do the boats, can they sleep and do they come with a skipper and a cook? Um, certainly I can tell you that uh, most of these boats are four cabin vessels. So generally we're talking about eight people, so four couples. Uh, and then Trevor, what's your situation there with the skipper and cook question? Oh, easy. If you wanted a skipper and a cook, we'd just order that uh, with the booking for the boat. Well, we've already made the booking for the boat and it would be an extra. And I wouldn't put eight people plus skipper and cook on the boat. I think uh, six is fine. And very often these cooks and skippers work as a team so they can take a cabin. But if you go, for example, to the 47, it's got... Yes, uh, two cabins in front of the other four. Yeah, it's got the crew cabin. That's right. So they can, people can. Uh, Plenty of options. Frank can contact you and uh, yes. and, and have a chat about that. But and, yeah. but obviously the other thing too, you, you talk about the um, the, the uh, chef, um, a skipper and a cook. You you're so often eating ashore, aren't you? Well, but you've just said what Maggie just wrote. In fact. Um, the, the skipper I can see, yes, yes, for sure. But if you've got six dinners ashore that we arrange and yes. are included, then the other times you need uh, to feed yourself, you're probably in port anyway, or you do yes. a simple lunch along the route. Would you agree with that, Maggie? Look, definitely you would be able to eat ashore every day. You could eat breakfast, lunch and dinner ashore most days. Yes. So that you don't really have to prepare very much food on board if you don't want to. Some people love to cook on board and go and find a little place to drop an anchor and be alone. That's fine too. But we never leave so early that you can't go ashore and have breakfast. And you can always pick up something at the baker or whatever for lunch. Yes. Really, it's the easiest place in the world to feed yourself yes. very lazily. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, got a great uh, message there from Diane who said, sorry, we're about to get signal again. We're currently on our way from Italy to Greece and on to Turkey. So uh, they're, they're, they're existing Fontaine Major owners. So they're obviously already over there sailing and enjoying the season, which is great news. So Fantastic. thank you, Diane, for that comment. And then um, here's one for you, Trevor. Um, Peter has asked, is there any reason why you don't take in the islands of Simi within your itinerary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, it's because... I can tell you it's, it's quite simple. Um, once upon a time, and not that long ago, you could go into Simi and spend uh, 24 hours there without having to formally enter and without having to formally exit Turkey. We do the same at Castellorizo, which is east of Marmaris. In the current circumstances, that isn't 
possible. And if we take uh, Simi into the full itinerary, frankly, we just run out of time unless we can turn it into a three-week trip. Or a month. Or a month. <laughs> but if you were there on your own, you wouldn't go past Simi without stopping, for sure. Okay, good answer. Yeah. And then um, uh, a couple of questions are coming in. So I, I think this is a very important question, Trevor, and, and one that Malcolm has asked, which I'm sure other people are also concerned about. Uh, and it's, a, it's what is the present situation with COVID in the itinerary that is planned for 2021? Well, if and we can't... There, come on, sorry. And, and sorry, and the question says, is there a cancellation policy or clause for a valid reason? I, I think the answer is, if it happens again, it would be a repeat of what's been done this year, right? Correct. Um, we are obviously watching this situation closely, and there are two factors. One is being able to get there. Um, of course, one is the situation there, and I'm told that you wouldn't even know that there was anything happening. I think Turkey has been quite lucky. Their infection rate is very low. Their recovery rate is very high, and they've had relatively few deaths. But nonetheless, it's there. So first of all, if we can't run this event in May, the last two weeks of May, we will combine it with what we have planned for September. Yes. And the likelihood that the situation has eased is far greater, of course. And the other thing is, unfortunately, if the situation doesn't change so far as the border is concerned, we will do an event that stays entirely in Turkey, which I can assure you is not such a bad thing. So we have this whole circumstance on our radar and we will com confirm our planning, I would say October, November time this year, um, when it hopefully will be clearer. Thank you. And we all understand that it's very fluid, so you can only do Look. what you do. And but, then, um, uh, Michael has asked, will this be the only rally using catamarans? And I, I'm certain the answer is no. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> it's certainly not going to be the case, but let me say that we use catamarans exclusively in Tahiti, in Tonga, in the Caribbean. Um, catamarans, frankly, in a group are a little difficult when you're talking about the med because of the lack of space. But on this route, I've checked all that out and got my plan A and B and C. But um, I think uh, the catamaran thing is, for example, in this particular fleet, less than five years ago, you could count on three of the fingers on one hand how many catamarans they had in their fleet. And uh, they are now exclusively Fontaine Peugeot and there are at least eight of them there. So they're the thing of the future so far as the Met is concerned. It's really made sailing accessible to people who are not hardcore yachties who want to chillax and have a home and the whole catamaran thing has just taken off amazingly in in meaning that you can go sailing with a family. So yes, they are on our agenda because it's such a great way to get out and about on the water. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so listen, I'm going to bring this to a, to a close now, guys. Michael Lysart did just type in and say, well done guys and a, a great itinerary. Looking forward to this one. I, I think they must be itching at the uh, bit to go and help you guys host this event next year. Great. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say one thing finally, Greg, to do with your last question or comment. Yes. The September event is already going to be a combined monohull catamaran exercise due to yes. what we've had to carry over from this year. Yes. It's just uh, that the cats are gonna be faster because yes. of the wind direction, so we'll have to handicap them accordingly. Yeah, and now that's And yachts hate to be beaten by catamarans. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so listen. Thanks, uh, mate. Thanks everybody. Listen, uh, the Joyce family and the Mariner boating team, you've done fantastically today. And uh, that was a really good webinar. We've covered a lot of ground, the presentation, the images, and uh, the, the wealth of knowledge that you, uh, that you all bring to the region is, is 
is really good. So as mentioned, that will now go up onto our YouTube channel and I'm sure you guys will also put it up on your website for people to tune into if they want. Uh, so on behalf of everyone that's tuned in today, thank you very much uh, for joining us for our multi Hole Solutions webinar series. And um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Trevor. Really well done. Thank Thanks, you. Ray. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Bye. Thanks, Rachel, for your technical Thank support. you, everyone, for joining in. <laughs>